Okay, for the warm-up questions, the first one, the sum of three consecutive numbers is 42. The sum can be represented by the below equation. What does n represent? Well, to get consecutive numbers, you add one to the previous number to get the next number, and then to add another one, and you add another one. That's how you get consecutive numbers. Here are my three consecutive numbers. This is the first number. This is the second. This is the third number. They want to know what does the n represent? Well, n, in this case, is the first number, which is also the lowest number. The second one, a job advertisement states a position pays $12 an hour. Which equation represents the relationship between salary and the number of hours? Your salary is equal to 12 times the number of hours you worked. And you can check this. I did tw um, $12 per hour. And if I multiply that times the number of hours I work, I do in fact get a dollar amount, which is my salary. So in your notes, I need you to answer these four questions. I'm gonna give you about a minute to do those four and think about number five right there. The sum of the first one odd integers, one equals just one. Sum of the first two, so I'm gonna add one plus three, which is gonna be four. The sum of the first three, well, I already know that amount right there is four, so I'm just gonna add five to it and get nine. One plus three plus five, I just found out that that is equal to nine. Add seven to nine, I get 16. In chat, does anything, anybody see anything special about the numbers one, four, nine, and 16. What do you notice about the numbers one, four, nine, and 16? Please type your answers in chat. Uh, I don't see anybody go on. Let me do another one. One plus three plus five plus seven plus nine is 25. They go odd and even. Okay, that's not what I'm looking for. You should recognize the following number pattern. One, four, nine, 16, 25, 36, 49, 64, Eighty-one, one hundred, one twenty-one, one forty-four. Anybody got an idea about that yet? That list of numbers I wrote up there in green. They're not all odd. Four is not odd. Sixteen, thirty-six are not odd. They alternate odd, even, odd, even. But that's not the special thing I'm looking for. You multiply the same number together and stuff. Yep. Okay, what do we call when I multiply a number by itself? What do you call when you multiply a number by itself? It starts with the letter S. Squaring it, yep. 
So if you rec no, one squared is one, two squared is four, three squared is nine, four squared is 16. When I want the sum of the first one odd integer, I get one, which is one squared. When I want the sum of the first two odd integers, I get four, which is two squared. For the sum of the first three odd integers, I get nine, which is three squared. When I want the sum of the first four odd integers, I get 16, which is four squared. Okay? The pattern you're getting is you have the sequence of perfect squares. So my question for you is, what is the sum of the first 50 odd integers without adding them all up? Okay? Well, if... I if I want to find the fourth odd integer, I square four. The sum of the sum of the first four odd integers, I square four. So the sum of the first 50 odd integers, I want to square 50, which I know is five squared times 10 squared, which is 25 times 100, which is 2,500. So you don't need to go 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7 plus 9 plus 11 plus 13 into a calculator. You can just do 50 squared in the calculator and get the 2,500. I want to show you another way that you can see that these things are perfect squares. I'm going to add a blank slide really quick. So one way that I could represent the number 1 is with a single dot. Okay, and that dot is one unit by one unit. One way that I can represent the number three is with three dots. It's like this. Okay, then I can represent the number five with five dots. And the number seven with seven dots. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stack these things together and kind of show you the pattern for the first X number or first in odd integers. So if I start out with one, I get a one by one square. If I add three to that one, all I'm doing is copying what I had before. I now have a two by two square. If I add my number five, I now have a three by three square. And if I add the number seven, I end up with a four by four square. So this is a way that you can visually see why you're getting perfect squares for your answers. Okay. I had no burning questions, but there was one question that talked about um, the group of problems. Uh, seven to 11, change my pin size. And what it did is it gave you something like three T plus five semicolon and then they gave you a, a number, they, they either said like t equals two or they put a semicolon two. What they're telling you is put this two in for the variable and tell, you what, tell me what you get. So I put the two in for t, add five to it, I can get six plus five is 11. So that's what that meant there. It just basically they wanted you to do that wonderful substitution step. Since there weren't any other questions on the homework, we're going to go to our lesson for today. And the title of today's stuff is Use a Problem Solving Plan. And there really isn't a one way method that will always work to solving every single problem. Okay. But there are some general steps that your book lists. The first step that your book lists is to read 
and understand the problem. And I'm going to do some examples of all of these steps um, before you get assigned your homework. But you want to find out, what do you know? What do you need to know? So what do you need to find? Okay, so that's the, the big thing there. Then you want to make a plan. Okay, this is where you answer the questions, how am I going to solve Basically, you're asking yourself, which tools in my toolbox can, can I, which tools can I use to solve the problem? Number three is to actually solve the problem using your plan. If you get stuck and you can't continue on, go on back and try, try a different, you know, Figure out if there's another way you can do it and try to solve again until you can come up with an answer. And the last one, which most students don't do, but you should do, is what they call look back. And in this step, you want to check a couple things. Is my answer reasonable? Do I, did I answer the right question? Do I have the correct units? Okay. Make sure that all those things are true. Okay. And the biggest one is making sure your answer is reasonable. So what I'm going to do is actually work through some pro um, actually before we work through some problems, there's a list of formulas that you need to be able to use. Um, one formula, the first one, I will give it to you anytime you need to use it. The rest of the formulas I will not give you. These are ones that sh um, either in middle school math were given to you. For example, distance equals rate times time or interest equals principal times rate times time. Or come from their basic definitions. And you are going to use them a lot this year. Okay? So I'm going to tell you what each of the letters mean. So C is equal to degrees Celsius or degrees centigrade. F is equal to degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so this for first formula would turn degrees Fahrenheit into degrees Celsius. The second formula is our simple interest formula, where I is equal to the interest earned P is your principal which is how much you put in the bank so this is your starting amount R is your interest rate as a decimal, for example, 10%, I would put 0.1 in for my R, and T is equal to your time, and in most cases, your interest rate and your time, most of the time, your rate and your time are in years. These two have to match. The um, interest rate would be like percent per year, then you have to use time in years. If your interest rate is in percent per month, your time has to be in months. The next equation is our distance traveled, where D is equal to distance. R is equal to your average or a constant speed. And 
and T is equal to time. Okay. For our profit equation, there are two of them. The book uses this first one. I don't use I don't use the first one because I I always keep my capital I for interest. This I here is not interest. So for the profit equation, our P is equal to profit. If you use the I that is equal to income, okay, E is equal to expenses. Okay, I don't use the letter I. I replace the I with an R, capital R, and I call that capital R revenue. So the one I typically use is profit equals revenue minus expenses. Well, if you want to be able to calculate your revenue, your revenue is equal to P, which is price of each item times Q, which is equal to the quantity sold. Same thing here. Income would equal price times quantity. For your expense equation, your expenses, so E is your expenses, V is equal to your variable cost. For example, if I'm making candles and the materials to make a candle cost me $2 for each candle, my variable cost would be $2. If my candle molds cost me $100, those would be a fixed cost because I can reuse those candle molds all of the time. So F is my fixed costs. And again, that Q is equal to my quantity. So those are formulas that you're going to need to be able to use. The only one I'm going to explicitly give to you, which means I'm going to write down for you anytime you need to use it, is the temperature formula. So the rest of them, you either need to have your notes ready or have a card flag that has these formulas on them. So you can write them down and practice start using them. And by the time you're done with the Algebra 1 class, these should become second nature for you. Does anybody have any generic questions on the formulas? If so, type them in chat. Otherwise, I'm gonna go on to actually solving some problems. So the first one. Any trees around the perimeter of a rectangular park the park is 72 feet by 48 feet. The trees need to be spaced 12 feet apart. A tree is to be planted in each corner. How many tree, trees are needed? Okay. So if we go back to my steps, I need to understand the problem, figure out what I know, what I need to find, then plan, then solve, and look back. So let's look at here. What do I know and what do I, what do I need to find? Well, what do I know? I know I have a park that is 48 by 72 feet. Okay, I need to, the trees are 12 feet apart. And trees that have trees in the corner. And I need to um, find the number of trees. Okay. So the first way, so that's what I, I'm trying to write and understand the problem. Now what I need to do is I need to come up with a plan. Well, there's a couple ways I can think about this for my plan. So I can think about find perimeter. And then determine, 
or solve for how many 12 foot spaces I have. Okay? But let's think about this. I'm just gonna do one, one side right now because when I get all done with this, if I start here, let me make the pin bigger. If this is my first tree, because I have to have one in the corner. Why aren't you going? There you go. So I have to have one in the corner. My next one is gonna be at 12 feet, then 24, then 36, and then 48. When I'm thinking about my problem solving plan, most students, when they first try this problem, are just going to take, hey, take this 48 and divide it by 12, and that's going to give you four, so I need four trees. But you need one extra tree because you got to put the one where you started. So I have to determine how many 12-foot spaces plus one for the starting point. Okay? So what I can do is I can do that. Um, if I were to do the whole perimeter thing, I'm going to do 48 times 2 plus 72 times 2, which is 96, plus 144, which is equal to 240. I need 240 feet of trees, okay? And if I use this thought process, okay, divide it by 12, that's going to tell me I need 20 trees, but I need to take into account the first one I had, which is 21. Now, if you couldn't do that, figure that out by yourself, what you could do is just do what I did right here. I need five on the top. I need five on the bottom. Well, now let's figure out how I need them down the sides. I'm gonna start out at one of my corners. So I go one, 12, oops. I need to reload that jam really quick. I hit the uh, close. Sorry about that. And I have to represent. Okay, it says I'm representing. I want to go back to that page. And there we go. So I start out with the one of my corners. So I start where I begin, then I go 12 feet, 24, 36, 48, 60, 72. And I'm gonna put one, two, three, four, five more in here. And then what I can do is I can actually draw them out and then I can go back through and I can count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Hmm, there are 20. So I go back and look at it. I did not need to add one to that one for some reason. And I have to figure that out. If I was just doing one side, I have to add the one. But if I'm doing multiple sides, the reason why you don't have to add one is because that one that you were adding from where you started is actually your finishing one, okay? So I purposely did this because sometimes your plan will not work. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to actually check my answer was reasonable, and that's where that drawing came from, okay? And something like this is, if this was really, really big, and I didn't, and I didn't want to draw, let's say it was 480 feet by 720 feet, I wouldn't necessarily have to draw the, the full thing. I could have made this 24 feet by 36, which would have been one, two, three, then 12, 24, 36. And I could have counted the dots on a smaller problem that is very similar to actually check to make sure my thought process is correct. So where students get messed up is what I purposely did here is like, oh, wait a second. There isn't four for the top, there's five in the top. So I'm gonna always have to add that one. But when you go all the way back around, that one that you added is actually the ending one from the last one you did. So 
There may be times that your first thing is gonna be wrong. If it is, go back and fix it. Try to figure out why it's wrong. And after a while, if you keep, if you see a lot of similar problems like this, whether he's planting trees or planting flowers or they're putting things around the edge of a picture, you're gonna be, you're gonna start to see them more frequently and you're going to be able to use that information and you're not gonna make that mistake initially. So the next one I'm gonna do. In an aviary, there are three times as many finches as mockingbirds. If there are 48 birds, how many mockingbirds are there? So what do I know? There are three times as many finches as mockingbirds. So what that is telling me is if I know what the number of mockingbirds are and I multiply that times the number of three, I'm gonna get the number of finches, okay? I know there are 48 birds. So I know that the number of mockingbirds plus the number of finches has to equal 48. What do I wanna know? I wanna know what M is equal to. Okay, so I've got the information written down for what I know. What I need to do is I got it, and I know we we'll found out what I need to find. So what I need to do is have my plan. My plan is I'm gonna take these two equations and somehow put them together so I can come up and figure out what my M is. Well, if I look here, I know what F is equal to. F is equal to 3M. So I see this F on the right-hand side. Anywhere that F is on the right-hand side, I can replace it with 3M. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rewrite this equation. I'm gonna copy this first M. Where the F was, I'm gonna replace it with 3M. And I know that has to equal 48. I'm gonna combine my like terms. I know that 4M is 48 and M is 12. So the number of mockingbirds is 12. So I need to figure out if this is reasonable. Well, I'm, well, if I figure out the mockingbirds is 12, 48 minus 12 is my number of finches, which is 36. Is 36 three times 12? Yes, it is. So I'm able to quickly go back and check my answer to see if it works. Are there any questions on the bird problem? Okay, um, I don't know how those dots got there, but I'm going to erase them. So last one, you are responsible for buying camping supplies for a camping trip. You can buy packages of stew that just need water added and then are heated. Each package costs $4.95 and contains enough stew for two people per day. You need enough, you need to buy enough so that you can have stew for six days of the trip for three days of the trip. I, there will be eight people on the trip. I need to know number of packages and cost. So I need to know number of packages and my total cost. The stuff I know is each package is good for two people per day. And each package is $4.95. I know there are three days. There are eight people. So what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna figure out the number of packages. And the way I'm gonna figure out the number of packages is figure out the number of people days I have. Okay, so I'm gonna figure out people days. I have three days times eight people, okay? And then I know that each package is good for two people per day. So I've got 24 of them. So I have 24 
divided by 2 is 12. I should need 12 packages. Okay? So once I know I need 12 packages, I'm going to take that 12 and multiply it by the 495. And I'm actually going to multiply 12 times 5 and get 60. And then, and then I'm going to subtract 60 cents from that. So my total amount is going to be $59.40. Or you could stick the 12 times 495 in the calculator, which I'm going to do right now, and I should get the exact same number. $59.40. So do I know the number of packages? Yes, there are 12 of them. And do I have the total cost? Yes, it's $59.40. Now let's check for reasonableness, okay? Each day I need how many packages? Let's think of that. So I have eight people, divide eight by two, I get four, so I need four packages per day. Okay, that's just a, a quick reasonable, another way to go through it. So I need four packages per day, and I have three days, and again, I get 12 packages, okay? So that's a way for me to go back Think about it another way to go back and um, possibly um, check for reasonableness. So I'm going to stop the recording.